from the geology and the, and the resource estimate, you know, what, what to look for in that. Um, not just whether it's a jork resource, but whether it's, it's compliant in what category is there upside. Not every project that comes in is a jork resource estimate. Many projects that we see in China are done under Chinese resource estimates. But that resource estimate is, you need to determine how reasonable is it, how has it been estimated, and what's the likelihood of being able to be converted. Um, I mean, has it been done from a geologist's perspective, manually, with aid of computer, or is it simply computer modeling? Computer modeling has a way of just basically spitting things out without any interpretation. And the spitting out aspect tends to be too aggressive. You don't get the touchy-feely side of a geologist saying, mm, I don't like how that's bent. So therefore, that range is, has been removed. Also, what's, what's um, I wouldn't say common, but, but does happen in China is that there is a view in terms of the, what I refer to as the range of influence of a deposit. Um, simply because you have one producing mine on the left-hand side and 300 meters away there's a, a deposit on the other side that, because that's producing, therefore this one will also produce. So you, you need to be in a position where that deposit proves its resources and reserves and not just by association. The other thing that, uh, as I mentioned, moving in from George 2012, this work needs pre-feasibility studies. So three-year-old reserve estimates or even one-year-old reserve estimates need to be supported by, by a feasibility study and also, as mentioned, a, uh, an MPV to support the reserves. Dilution is, is very important and, and, and often when, when presented is never taken into consideration properly. Uh, if you have a five meter coal seam that's either close to the surface or is sharply dipping and you need to re remain uh, or keep a certain amount of support, if it's five meters and you need to leave one meter behind, well, you don't have a five meter coal vein, you have essentially four meters, so you have to take consideration that dilution. And a lot of the feasibility studies that, that are coming out are, are often done by um, modifying factors rather than actual work. So the institutes will have varying data and information from similar projects, particularly on the processing side, that a project of this size, of this particular deposit, of this particular milling rate, will produce X with X dilution. And uh, so they'll apply that to the project in the feasibility state without actually doing the work. Um, so that's something that's very dangerous in terms of, um, uh, of, of the outturn because the, the processing side of the business is very, very uh, complex. From, from the market's perspective, has there been a marketing study done on the project? It's simple to say, yeah, well, copper is going to be at a particular price, but you know, if you're producing a particular type of concentrate, does it contain what's referred to as deleterious or, or bad things in the concentrate? Um, there's going to be supply demand shifts. Um, you don't know what the price is going to be in, in three years, despite the forecast, despite the thought of being able to hedge. Um, but essentially, a project with a long lead time doesn't know what their selling price is going to be at the end of the day. From the operating cost side, um, watch out for you know, a mix of old studies and new commodity prices. As, as mentioned, there's been considerable inflation on the cost side, so there's a tendency to say, okay, let's, the costs aren't that bad, let's keep them here. Uh, we're expecting gold to be at $1,800 in three years, so let's, let's use the price of production from four years ago and prices for you know, $1,800 in three years from now. So, that doesn't make sense, but that's something that is presented to you and you've got to watch out for. The CSR side, again, as I mentioned, if you've got somebody sitting on the side of a hill, you've got to move them. And that needs to be built into to the OPEX and, and the CAPEX. From the economics perspective, that's again, that's just back to, uh, to looking at the NPV and ensuring the appropriate rate's been used. Um, but, but importantly, uh, it, when someone presents a project and presents the economics, um, there's a tendency to slip in the inferred resources as part of that uh, valuation and calculation. And 
although it can be done for fun, but uh, it doesn't have any basis of valuation. And, and um, as I mentioned, inferred resources don't necessarily mean they will be measured or even if they will become a reserve. So, the, uh, the permitting side, um, you know, it's something you see a lot from, from Indonesia. It's a complex IUP system, it's a complex ownership structure. Um, in many cases, you don't really know what the ownership uh, status is until, until the end, which is a bit of a surprise. It's about the last thing you want. So the legal due diligence in terms of the ownership is, is, is very important. And especially, you know, expired um, or waiting for renewal permits are, are just simply not the same as, uh, as being renewed. You wrote that there was a... Uh there's, just because a company or a project doesn't have a jork report, that it's not a fatal flaw. This brings up the whole point about your 10 risks. Where do you draw the line between saying this is too risky or not, or, or is a risk that you can deal with, that you're aware of, therefore that you can manage? It must be very hard for retail investors to, to know where that line is drawn. Can you give us more of a, a guidance on, on where to draw that line? Well, yeah, but I think that particular comment is referred to on looking at it from an institutional perspective because the retail side or the IPO side, the public float, it is done on a JORP compliant resource estimate. So that information is disclosed, it's there. Um, to translate that into a risk question, well, if it has a lower end category within JORP, then it's potentially viewed as a riskier asset than the one that's got a proven resource that is mineable, et cetera. Now that should be reflected in the, the, the valuation at the listing time. But to address a specific comment, if it does or doesn't have a JORC resource, it's not a fatal flaw. And what I'm referring to there is that the project just simply may not have done work under JORC compliant requirements because it's, it's in the far-flung regions of another part of the world or it's in China and the Chinese resource estimates, et cetera. So it's a simple matter of, of converting that resource estimate to JORP. But you need to understand where is it in the, in the value chain with respect to the resource estimate, that low end or the top end. So institutions might say, we have the expertise, we can deal with this risk. Would you say that retail investors should always insist on a JORP report? Well, I, again, the answer to that is, is yes, because I, I don't think they're in a situation or position to invest in something that doesn't have one, because all of the public all the public investing is centered around that resource estimate as Jork. 